Today's lecture is on marine salvage and how it pertains to the United States Coast Guard. I would highly encourage you to read the, the course reader and do the learning activities again just as a, um, an additional tool to help you understand this lecture. You can see here where there's a couple of videos. Each one of these is about 50 minutes long and you don't need to watch them both. Uh, you don't actually have to watch them at all if you already know what marine salvers do. However, they're just it's a good good thing to watch so that you get a basic understanding of marine salvage in operation and some of the perils that are associated with a lot of these jobs that our, our contractors actually complete for us. So what is marine salvage? Marine salvage is in the most basic terms trying to save property that is on the high seas that may be in peril. So what types of things am I talking about? I'm talking about fire, groundings, sinkings, elisions, collisions, um, you know, things of this nature. And you can see in the top left here some of the tools they're using. So the top left they're using what's called beach gear. So they're using a bunch of equipment that's on shore to be able to right or pull this vessel into a position that is more easy, more easily salvaged. So the basic idea here is we want to, if we can, and by we I mean contractors, remove wrecks from harbors to ensure that commerce can freely flow. We also want to make sure that the wrecks are not leaching anything toxic into the environment. So that's a huge part of what we're looking at. But the secondary would be to try and regain any lost property for the people who are responsible for this in the first place. So that's, that's a big a big piece of the puzzle for the responsible parties. They want to get as much back as they can after something like this happens. That is not necessarily the Coast Guard's concern. The Coast Guard's typically concerned about the economics and the environment. So as we move on, we can see some examples of marine casualties. And we're looking at the top left being something that was submerged and taken out of a waterway. Top right, of course, is a fire. The left is a capsized vessel. And to the bottom right, is a vessel that's run aground. So we'll talk a little bit about what happens in these situations. So first we need to know what the salver is. Now the salver is technically anyone. Anybody that's trying to salvage a vessel. But typically speaking, for these large salvage operations, we use commercial salvers or people who do this for a living. They have all the right equipment, the necessary education in order to do it, and they have a lot of experience in doing it correctly and working with the federal government. So this is this is something that they do in order to get paid obviously and typically their payment is some sort of salvage value for what they're recovering. So it's in their best interest to recover as much of the material as they can so that they can get either the scrap value for the metal or for the vessel's overall uh, worth after the casualty. So they're doing this for a percentage of what they recover. So who is the salvage master. The salvage master works for the salvage company and I like to think of them as like a master chief in the in the Coast Guard. All right, they're the old salts, right? They've been there, done that. They know how to move materials and get people moving and get a lot of complex things together to accomplish a, a pretty difficult task. So they're typically the more experienced people and they're very good at liaising with the United States Coast Guard or whoever the on-scene regulator is. Now the salvage engineer, their job's a little different. So they're not the in the mud, in the dirt, doing the salvage type of uh, professional. What they're doing is going through and making sure for a vessel that maybe needs to be righted, that all the ballasting considerations are taken into place so that they can load tanks or put weights on the vessel to make sure it's righted properly. They'll also be looking at the structure of the vessel to make sure that it can be righted without breaking up further and causing more damage or make it harder to salvage later. Uh, the salvage engineers are also going to look at the locations of oil tanks, fuel tanks, and all of these different things so they can devise a plan for this vessel that minimizes its impact. So extremely important job. Salvage team members. So there are so many different types of marine casualties that could happen that you have to have at the ready a bunch of different specialties and you can see here they're listed and you can understand by looking at these things why all of these might be needed so hazmat I just want to pick on a few of these things that might be not as obvious so the hazmat teams which stands for hazardous materials so 
If you remember in last lecture, we talked a lot about um, different chemicals and different types of caustic liquid substances or noxious liquid substances. Well, that's a hazmat. That's a hazardous material. So we need to know how to s make those materials safe in this salvage operation. So you're going to have a hazmat team that does that or maybe even recovers some of this hazardous material. And again, moving down further, the hydrographic survey team. Now, these people are going to look at the bottom of the, of the ocean and try and give a lot of good recommendations to the salvage team on, on how they may accomplish this task based on the bottom type. So if this vessel is precariously placed on the bottom of a, of a sub-ocean trench, they may advise that they shore up the vessel prior to starting any salvage operations so it doesn't fall down and go down into this really, really deep area of the ocean, which makes it more difficult to recover. So what is a Coast Guard and Marine salvage? Like what, what is our overall responsibility here and where do we do it? Well, we do it anywhere we have a U.S. interest, so most typically that's somewhere inside our exclusive economic zone. But even, even closer to the point is we'll, we'll want to have response in our ports for sure because we have a vested interest in clearing that port so that we can continue to have commerce come in and out. We also don't want our ports to be polluted. We are responsible for maintaining the environmental conditions in our ports and the surrounding areas. So having a vessel in there that le leaches oil is not in our best interest either. So why do we do it? Well, that, that is why we do it, is because we're responsible federally for ensuring that we can have commerce freely flowing and the environment isn't negatively impacted by these operations. So do we actually do it? Well, yes and no. Uh, typically speaking, the answer is, is no, we don't do it. We are the federal oversight. We're the regulatory people who ensure that the salvage teams or these commercial salvers are doing the job properly. Do we have the ability to respond to oil spills? We do. We have that capability and on occasion we may execute those capabilities. So some key components to marine salvage within the United States Coast Guard and the federal government in general is our command structure. So we have a command and this is for oil spills or incidences that happen inside our exclusive economic zone, we'll have what's called a federal on-scene coordinator. And we'll talk a little bit about what they do in a little bit. And we also have this other person, this other entity, which is the captain of the port. So the federal on-scene coordinator is typically the captain of the port because these incidences tend to occur in much smaller areas inside the United States Coast Guard's area of responsibility for a certain port or a certain marine safety officer's port. And the captain of the port is a Coast Guard officer typically. So in most cases, the federal on-scene coordinator is the captain of the port in that area of responsibility. If we drop back and look a little bit at what happened in Deepwater Horizon, we can see that the captain of the port was not the federal on-scene coordinator. In fact, initially the EPA had a, or I'm sorry, the FEMA had a federal on-scene coordinator who was later relieved by Admiral Allen, who became the federal on-scene coordinator. He was not the captain of the port. However, the incident was large enough to necessitate a, a federal on-scene coordinator that had more experience and more ability to move massive amounts of materials and people and coordinate a lot of different intricate things. So what are some of the things they have in your, in your back pocket as a federal on-scene co coordinator or the captain of the port? Well, we have field support. If this happens in my general vicinity, or the AOR, the captain of the port, I have a sector there. Now that sector has a marine safety office that's capable of providing people that can go out and regulate the salvage operation. We also have strike teams. Now strike teams are capable of moving and getting oil response and pollution items on scene in a very quick amount of time. We have engineering support, which there is some organic support there at the sectors in that marine safety office. However, the, the kind of the mecca of marine safety here is the Marine Safety Center. Now the Marine Safety Center has lots of well-educated engineers who can sit back and analyze these issues and make appropriate recommendations to the federal on-scene coordinator. So as we look here, we've got the sector commander. Sector commander, Coast Guard captain, is the captain of the port. So their overall job is to ensure the safety of their port and the security and protect the marine environment. That's their job, so that's what they need to do. 
the federal on-scene coordinator, again, this is typically the captain of the port, but it can be delegated lower if appropriate, is pre-designated by the U.S. Coast Guard or the EPA. And their job is to direct the federal removal efforts at the scene of an oil or hazardous substance discharge. And while we're doing this, we're using something called the ICS, the Incident Command Structure. Now, the Incident Command Structure was formed by firefighters in California who typically needed to have surge firefighters come in and help the wildfires, help put out the wildfires. So they found quickly that they weren't communicating on the same comms plans, they had different operations, and were not easily meshed together. So the federal government decided, in order to aid in incidences like this, where we needed to surge workers, that we were going to come up with the ICS and make sure that all of our comms plans were intercompatible and that we were doing things in similar manners and coordinating efforts in a way that made sense across all agencies. So this is what we do. We use the ICS structure, and the ICS structure helps support the federal on-scene coordinator to make informed decisions about the disaster at hand. So for the federal on-scene coordinator, <clears throat> or the captain of the port, what's the best case scenario? Well, best case scenario is we have a responsible party, which could be the vessel owner, that is quickly moving and doing the right things. They're, in, they're interested in quickly rectifying the situation, and that they're providing information up the chain of command in a quick and reasonable manner so that decisions can be made at a higher level that may affect the salvage operations. So this is the best case scenario. You have somebody that's interested in doing the work. They were like, hey, no, we realize we messed up. We've got these people coming in to fix it. We're doing it quickly. And here's all the information we have. We'll continue to provide it as it comes. Best case scenario. So what are some of the things that might make us say, eh, this might not be the best case scenario? Well, the federal on-scene regulator <clears throat> or the, the Coast Guard regulator that's on-scene reporting to the FOSC can say, hey, the responsible party is not really being proactive or responsible. They're slow and they are not actually capable of doing this operation. That's a bad thing. And that may prompt us to federalize this case, which means the Coast Guard would take over, contract another salvage team that they have faith in, to actually complete this task. And of course, we're going to be billing the owner of the vessel after the fact. So some of the reasons we may also federalize is that the responsible party has hired a salvage company that we know has bad past performance. We have just records upon records of different salvage companies. And we're like, well, well typically speaking, they fail 95% of the time. They're slow to respond. They don't provide information up the chain. We may be like, all right, got it. You're trying to do the right thing. You just picked a bad company. We're taking over now because we need to get this done quickly. We don't have time for you to figure out who a better salvage company would be. And, of course, anytime we suspect someone of terrorism, it's not exactly somebody we want working for us in a federal construct. So that would be another reason to federalize. So what are some of the resources that we have when we federalize? Well, we have a lot of industry salvage reps. So we have these ready-to-go contracts that we call BOAs. And these are pre-negotiated contracts that allow us to quickly move to a new salvage company once it's been federalized that we have faith in, we have a predetermined contract with them, including response times. So if we say we need a company that can respond quickly to an oil spill or hazard, we have a contract in place. We can call this company and they'll be there within the contracted amount of time and they'll get paid for those efforts. We typically pick these contractors based on their capabilities and response times for the, for the operations, as well as cost. That's always something that we need to worry about. So we also have funds available. And these funds are available through our regulatory actions. So we, on occasion, will fine people for environmental hazards or for, for a plethora, a myriad of, of, of different reasons. We fine, we fine companies. Well, all this money goes into a fund which can help us to, to pay for these operations. We have sector field personnel that have experience that can help to quickly respond, as well as the strike team and the CERT, uh, as well as other agencies that have vested interest. And we'll talk a little bit about the CERT here in a minute. So the CERT team was, was formed so that we had a quick action salvage, emergency, salvage engineering response teams available. 
And you know, you can see a couple of, of times we've actually used this, the Exxon Valdez runs aground, uh, the Mega Borg catches fire during an offloading procedure, and the Jupiter catches fire while offloading gasoline. So the salvage emergency response team is going to head out to these locations and quickly assess the situation and make appropriate actions. And again, they're going to bring contractors with them to help uh, combat these casualties. When you might need the CERT. Well, when any of these things happen, really it's a marine casualty. If it happens, you may need the CERT. So that's something that you're going to have to evaluate based on the capabilities you have organically at the sector. If you need more capabilities than you have, then you need to make sure that you call the CERT and, and get them in to do appropriate assessments. So if I look here, I'm going to click on this, and this is a offshore support vessel that was stuck in the mud, and this is, goes through the writing operations. So this is salvaging a buried offshore support vessel. And you can see, and the point of this is really to show you how complex these operations can be. Beso Marine mobilized the Derek Barge Lily Beso and Derek Lay Barge Big Chief to a location in the Gulf of Mexico, offshore of Louisiana, to salvage a 130-foot offshore support vessel, which sank and settled into 70 feet of mud. With the salvage equipment in on location, the salvage team welded a custom-fabricated 600-ton working load limit pad eye to the bow stem of the sunken vessel. With the pad eye in place, the Derrick Barge Lily Beso is attached to the vessel. As the Derrick Barge takes a strain on the pad eye, the Big Chief uses an airlift to excavate mud, thus creating a cavity around the vessel's hull. As the mud is removed, the mud suction on the vessel is mitigated, and the Derrick Barge increases the lift on the pad eye to approximately 600 tons. As sufficient mud is removed, the vessel slides out of the mud and is lifted through the water column to expose approximately 75 feet of it out of the water. With the vessel out of the mud hole, the salvage equipment is shifted away from the hole and the vessel is rotated 90 degrees. And then lowered back onto the seafloor, upside down. at which time the Derrick Barge releases the bow pad eye so that divers can run the salvage rigging required to roll the vessel upright. With the vessel re-rigged, the Derrick Barge commences the rolling operation, which simultaneously lifts the vessel through the water column to the surface. Okay, so that was a typical salvage operation, and you can see why you might need a lot of engineers in place to figure out how to do that. So again, we have some factors that affect stranding. Um, it, you know, this, this is a video, and it shows a vessel breaking in part. I, I don't know there's a whole lot of value in watching the entire video, but I'll post that link separately so that you can, you can see it. Uh, it's a vessel, and it's a slideshow that goes through and shows a motor vessel breaking up on the rocks. And this can increase the complexity of the salvage operation because now you're not dealing with an intact hull. You're dealing with a vessel that is now split into two parts. And again, refloating, there's a lot of calculations that go into a grounding type vessel. And we're going to cover some of those in this lecture as well. So as we look here, we can see this grounded vessel is actually being pulled further to sea, probably by a tug. And a tug has a certain capability based on its installed horsepower. So that's how we basically go through and ensure that we have 
the right equipment on scene is by determining the brake horsepower of the vessel. Now as we look, we can see a vessel that's currently stranded. And we know that normally the vessel is completely kept in place by the buoyancy of the water. So it's kept upright by the buoyancy of the water pushing on the hull. Now, as I go through and I try to I try to understand how much of my ship is being supported by the ground and how much is being supported by the water itself and the flotation of the vessel, I've got a couple of calculations here. The first calculation being this R value, and this R value is the reaction force. The reaction force is the amount of area that's being held by the land and not by the buoyant force of the hull. So how can I figure this out? Well, I can figure out what my buoyant force was before the stranding, <clears throat> or before I ran aground, and then I can subtract what this buoyant force is after the stranding. So we can talk about how to do that in a little bit, but I can also look at my nomograph and figure out what my displacement was before the stranding and subtract my displacement after the stranding. And I can do that by going through and from the nomograph, pulling down my values based on my draft. So as I use my draft markers, I will typically know what my values are before I'm stranded. So every day, somebody's going to go through and figure out what my overall values are for my list in trim. So I'll have my values prior to. The next one would be to figure out it afterwards, which might require somebody to go out and actually read the draft readings off the vessel. This seems like an easy task, and it is. If your vessel still have it, has its draft markers submerged, a lot of commercial vessels also have a mean draft marker. So in our Coast Guard vessels, we have a fore draft and an aft draft. So we can go from our nomograph, get our fore draft, and get our aft draft, and pretty quickly assess what our overall displacement was before and after. Now, if my bow is out of the water and I actually don't have the ability to to see my draft markers or they're not they're not registering well a commercial vessel can go through and now figure out what their mean draft is and their mean draft can help them figure out how hard a ground they are and I need to know this information because I need to know exactly what type of force I need to free my vessel so I can go through and talking about mean draft I've got my reaction force and I can take my mean draft before stranding which is what it was before I ran aground, subtract my mean draft after stranding, and then multiply that by my tons per inch immersion. Now my tons per inch immersion, I can get off my nomograph for whatever value I'm currently living at for uh, this vessel. So we can look through here and figure out how we're going to do this. So the other thing I told you is that I need to figure out this ground force reaction so that I can figure out how many horsepower I need my tugs to be to get me off the ground. So a good rule of thumb is that one short ton of bollard pull is equal to a hundred brake horsepower. So that's how many installed horsepower my engines are on the tug and that will equate to 100 brake horsepower to one short ton. Now that's an important distinction. We're doing this in short tons for bollard pull. So if I look, if I want to figure out how much force I need to free this vessel in short tons, because that's what I'm using for bollard pull, I'm going to take my ground force reaction, which I figured out from my displacements or from my mean draft values and TPI. I'm going to multiply that by a coefficient of friction. All right, this coefficient of friction is based on the bottom type, and you can see some common values for that right down here. And then I've got this number here, this 1.12. Well, this is a conversion factor. This is a conversion factor because in this value here, I'm using long tons. Now, this is important. My R value is in long tons because that's what I'm getting off my nomograph. When I multiply it by this 1.12, I now get short tons. So F is measured in short tons. This is underlined and in bold and circled and starred. You need to understand this, that this value you get out of here, even though you're putting in long tons, comes out as short tons. Now we have bollard pull. 
Bollard pull again. I told you the rule of thumb. The rule of thumb is what we're going to go by. However, there may be instances where this isn't true. So I've got this other Bollard pull calculation, which will be also based on my brake horsepower or the installed horsepower of my engines. And I'm going to multiply that by an efficiency rating. This efficiency rating is a K value. Now each tug has a K value. So there are many different types of tugs out there, and they propel, they propel themselves in different ways. This K value helps me equate how efficiently they're transitioning that horsepower that's installed to actual thrust. So this is an important value for that. So as we move through, and we want to look at how do we do this, well, let's do it for a 270. Let's do it for WMEC 906, in fact. So we've got 906 here. We've got the nomograph up and displayed. And we've got a couple of things that it's telling us. It's telling us what our forward draft is, what our aft draft is, before the stranding. And then we run a ground, and it tells us what our fore and aft drafts are. And it's asking us how many tons of ground we are. So if I look, my draft in feet in the forward draft is 13 feet 6 inches. So we're making this nice and easy, 13 and a half. My aft draft is 1311, so it is almost 14 feet. Let's call it about right there. And now as I draw my line across the nomograph, I'm going to be able to find out what my displacement is. And if I look here, my line isn't exactly straight. I get an initial displacement equal to 1800. Okay, well that's good to know. Now let's look and see what it is afterwards. So when the vessel goes aground, the drafts are 12, 9, and 13, 8. So 12, 6, 7, 8, 9, and 13, 8, about right here. So as I draw this line across again, I'm going to see that I get a value of a displacement here of an after grounding of about 1,700. So I know from previous slides that my R value is equal to my initial displacement before grounding minus my displacement after grounding. And in this case, that's 1,800 minus 1,700, which then gives us an R value of 100. And now this is important, right? My R value is in long tons. Not too bad. This isn't difficult to figure out if we have our nomograph and we know these values. So now let's look at a different way of doing this. Now let's look at some values that are given here if I have a mean draft change. Oh, okay, so now I don't have displacements. I'm looking at a change in mean draft. So if I look at my equation, I know that R is equal to my, I'm sorry, my mean draft before stranding minus my mean draft after stranding times TPI. Okay, so what is this value here actually equal? Well, this is my change in mean draft. So because we don't like this displacement symbol, let's call it my change in mean draft here. So this is my change in mean draft. It's already done for me, this part of the calculation, and it's 2.5. So now all I really need to do is figure out my tons per inch immersion and do the multiplication that ensues. So again, I'm 13.6 forward, I'm 13.11 aft. Now this is before the grounding. So I go through and I draw my line. Boom, there I go. Nice crisp line. And I get, if I look, I have to now do a horizontal line because what do I want? I want tons per inch immersion off this scale over here. So I'm going to take right where it intersects my displacement line and draw straight across. Now I'm going to read off this line as to what my tons per inch immersion is. And I know it's hard to read because I used a relatively thick pen, but we're going to call this value our TPI equal to 17 Point nine five, and this is in long tons per inch. Okay, so now I know that my R value is equal to 2.5 feet times long tons per inch. Uh-oh, feet and inch. All right, so what is R actually equal? Sorry, R actually equals 2.5 feet, and we know that 
in every foot there are 12 inches so I'm going to multiply 12 inches per one foot then I'm going to multiply that times my 17.95 long tons per inch units are important so now I've gotten rid of feet feet and I'm left with inches and long tons well my inches cancel inches cancel my overall value is in long tons and I get a value of R equal to 3.66 I'm sorry I'm sorry uh, my R value is equal to 538.5 long tons uh, math is hard I apologize for that mistake okay so there we go that's how we can do it two different ways so now as we we move on here and we're trying to understand what TPI actually is we can look at this next example and we look at what is the TPI of a vessel in fresh water that has a length of water line of, tw of 100 a beam of 20 longitudinal center flotation 5 feet aft of a midship a draft of 7, a depth of 12, and a displacement of 250 long tons, and a coefficient, a water plane coefficient of 0.79. All right. So what do we know? What do we know about TPI? We know, based on equations from the items we saw on our last exam, that TPI is actually equal to the overall... Um, area of the water plane, so the water plane area, the area of the water plane, times specific weight of the water, all over 12. All right, so now I need to look at what an area of the water plane is. So what's my water plane? My water plane is the part of the, if I cut right where the water line was, I took a snapshot and looked right down. So what do I need? Well, I'm going to need its length, and I'm going to need its beam. I don't need draft or depth in this case, but if I multiply my length, which is listed as 100 feet, and my beam, which is listed as 20 feet, I'm going to get an area of a square. That's why I need my water plane coefficient, because my water plane coefficient is going to give me the proportion of this square that is actually hull. So when I go through and do my TPI calculation, I find that it's 100 feet times 20 feet times my water plane coefficient of decimal 79 times, and now we're talking about fresh water in this case, so my overall um, specific weight is going to be 1 over 36, and I'm going to divide all of this by 12. All right, so all I did is follow the equation. And again, I need to make sure that I'm, I'm getting all of my units right. So this guy is in long tons per foot. And this is long tons per foot cubed. So as I move and I go through, I'm going to find that this guy right here is actually converting my feet to inches, right? So I've got um, a foot value down at the bottom. 100 times 20 times 0.79 divided by 36 times 12, 12 gives me a value of 3.66. And I'm left with long tons, right? Because I have this foot cubed. I'm converting. I've got feet here. Boom, this takes us to a squared. These are both feet. Boom, boom, got it. I'm left with inches up top because of this conversion down here. And now I have long tons per inch, which is exactly what we want it to be. So we're good. That's our value. Now as we move on, now let's look at a different type of problem. Now, what am I trying to accomplish in this problem here is try and establish what the bollard pull is necessary to free a vessel from the sandy bottom. Oh wait, I know an equation for this. So I need to figure out this force to free is equal to 1.12 times my coefficient of friction, static friction, times my R value. Okay, so what do I know? Well, I know U. It's given to me. That's great. So I know this is 0.4. Now i got to figure out what my R value is. 
well, I've gotten some, some nice information here. I'm given displacement though. So what do I know about displacement? Displacement is equal to the underwater volume times the specific weight, which is great. So I need this type of, of value to understand what I'm actually doing because I need to convert this into a force. And this guy right here does something real nice for me. It gives me a conversion, typically long tons per feet cubed, which is great. So I have this volume and I want to convert this now to a displacement, which gives me an R value. So before I do that, what I really want to know is what is my overall change in my volume. So my change in my displaced volume is going to be equal to my 10,000 feet cubed minus my 8,000 feet cubed. And I get a value for that of 2,000 feet cubed. Now this is the amount of volume that would have normally been supported by water but is now being supported by the ground. So I can take this 2,000 value, put it in for whatever water type I'm in. So in this case I'm in salt water. So I'm looking at a value of 1 over 35 for my specific weight. And I can take my displacement equation is equal to my 2,000, sorry, 2,000 feet cubed times my 1 over 35, and this is in long tons per feet cubed, and I can figure out what my R value is, or my displacement here, so this is now my R value, sorry, my change in displacement, and I get an R value that's equal to 57.1. What's my units? long tons. Perfect, because that's what I need for this equation here. So now I take my force equal to 1.12 times 0.4 times 57 decimal 1. And I get a force value equal to 25.6 short tons, right? Because I converted with this value up here. So this is my answer. So that's how I can use my submerged volume to, or the change in my submerged volume to actually find my force to free. Now that's great. I've got, I'm sorry, I figured out everything I need to do here. And I'm going to move on to another um, type of equation that is maybe, maybe more simple than it first, it first appears. So now I have a grounded ship. And last time we got a value of 25.6. But this time I'm going to say we are grounded and we are going to require 13 short tons to pull us off the bottom. So what I'm trying to understand here is how much installed power the tugboat needs to have in order to get me free. Installed power is another way of saying brake horsepower. When I seem to remember that we have one short ton is equal to 100 brake horsepower. So if I have now this overall equation, 13 short tons, if I want to keep this ratio the same, well, I need to multiply these two values. And now I have 1,300 short tons are required for my installed propulsion plant. And that's how you do it. So that's this in a nutshell. And I hope this was beneficial to you, and I hope that you can use it to study. Have a good one.